Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Mipul University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Sleeping Gods. Coming up. Let's learn to play Sleeping Gods, game designed by Ryan Laukat and published by Red Raven Games. I know it's quite a long video, so we put timestamp in the video description. So at any time you can jump right into a specific section. Now let's get to the table. It's 1929 and you and your fellow players are playing the role of Captain Sophie Odessa and her crew of nine as they pilot the Manticore ship around a strange world going on search for adventure. Sleeping Gods is a free-form game. You can explore as far and wide as you wish, ultimately in search of totems. So, enjoy the stories you uncover, and when the game ultimately ends, however that may happen, you'll gauge your success by the quest you've completed and the totems you've collected. I won't take you through the full steps of setup, but I'll show you some key things. This book represents the atlas, and it's the map that you'll traverse around the world. And you'll start with your ship in the region on page 2, showing locations 2 and 174. In the centre of the table, accessible to all players, you'll have these components. This board represents your ship, and will have a different side depending on your player count. This deck of 18 event cards is shuffled, but you'll be preparing it in a specific way by layering the three different severities of event cards. Nearby you'll place the crew board of Captain Odessa. She is controlled collectively by all players. And you'll also have your four starting adventure cards. These are medium sized cards which come from the market deck, showing this back, through the game, all of the team's collective adventure cards will be gathered in this area, available for all players to use. Other than the event cards, you'll have six other decks of cards and one deck of tokens. The ability cards, market cards and search tokens should be shuffled. The adventure cards, quest cards and enemy cards should be left in numerical order. And the adventure and quest cards can be left in their box. And the level cards can be placed face up, ready for when you purchase them. Keep your other tokens and components nearby ready for use. All components in the game are limited to the number provided by the game, with the exception of wound tokens. When setting up the players, each player will choose which of the crew members they will be controlling throughout the game. All crew boards are always used, so the eight remaining crew members are split as evenly as possible among the players. Then each player is dealt one ability card, and is given one command token. Throughout the game, each player will maintain a personal hand of ability cards and command tokens, which belong to the human player, and must be kept separate from any command tokens or ability cards which have been equipped to that player's crew members. There is a distinction in this game between actions taken by a player versus actions taken by a crew member, which players need to remember as they play. Choose a first player who takes the captain token and choose as a team whether you're going to play a normal or brutal game. You're now ready to play. Sleeping Gods is played in a series of turns and the active player on a given turn, who has the captain token, takes these three steps as indicated on the ship board. The player first chooses a new ship action from the five locations on the ship, then draws and resolves the top event card from the event deck, and then takes two actions out on the map, travel, explore, market or port, based on the current location of the ship. These two actions may be in any order, and can include taking the same action twice. The active player's turn is primarily carried out using that player's own crew members, as well as the common crew member, Captain Odessa, who is controlled always by the active player. But inactive players will be able to involve their crew members, usually at the cost of a command token, and we'll see how that works a little bit later. 
Once the active player's turn is complete, the captain token is passed to the next player clockwise, and play continues in this way until you reach the end of the adventure. So now let's look at each step in more detail. The first step of each turn is to take a ship action, and to do this, the active player takes the ship meeple from its current location and moves it to one of the four other locations on the ship. These are the deck, bridge, quarters, galley, or sick bay. If a location has two damage cubes on it, then it is not available. Then resolve the full effect of your location. This rectangle represents ability cards, and the active player draws that many ability cards into their player hand. The maximum hand size at any time is 3, and if you draw above, you must immediately discard down to 3. One thing that can be done with the ability cards is to equip them to the crew members in order to make them stronger in challenges. This may be done at any time as a free action, except during a challenge or combat. To do it, the player takes a card from hand, pays a number of command tokens based on the icon in the top right corner of the card, then slides the card into one of their crew members' two ability slots. You may not trade cards with other players or equip them into other players' crew members. We'll see later how doing this helps the crew members in combat and challenges. The lower blue hexagon represents a number of command tokens that the active player takes into hand. Where there are two numbers, this represents the different player counts on your side of the board. So here it would be 3 in a 3 player game, and 4 in a 4 player game. Then resolve the location effect. The quarters and the bridge allows you to remove 3 or all of the command tokens that are currently blocking your actions. As we will see later, certain actions on your adventure cards or crew boards require the spending and placing of command tokens to activate, and these actions are blocked out until you can use the quarters or the bridge to remove those and return them to the supply. At the sick bay, you remove one wound from a crew member, and at the galley, the active player may discard an ability card to remove one fatigue from a crew member. We'll learn more about how you gain wounds and fatigue later, and in all of these cases, tokens can be removed from active or inactive player's crew. At the deck, you'll go searching for resources through the search token deck. One at a time, you will flip search tokens up to a maximum of three, stopping at any point that you wish. Once you stop, claim the rewards printed on any one of the tokens that you've found, but the ship will suffer damage based on all of the ship damage icons that you flip. Each time you suffer ship damage, draw the top card from the ability deck, and then place a ship damage token into the area of the ship matching the number in the top corner. Should you draw a location which is already full, then you choose where the damage goes. Once you've finished with the action, you will discard the search tokens and only shuffle them back when the deck is empty. Any resources gained, such as food, building materials, or coins, are placed here and are always available to all players. There is no action at the hull, but there is a square to take one damage. Next, you'll move on to the event phase, where you will flip the top card of the event deck, and then resolve the text as shown. Some of these give you a single effect which occurs, some will give you two options for what you want to resolve, and some will be an ongoing effect until you can solve some sort of problem to discard the card. These events can result in a variety of things, all of which are resolved in a similar way to the four actions that you can take on the map, and that's what we'll talk about next. After resolving your event, you will resolve two actions out on the map. These can be chosen from Travel, Explore, Market, and Port, and you can do the same action twice. You may travel from any area on the map, but you may only explore in areas where there is a number in a red circle, you may only go to the market in an area of the market icon, and you may only go to a port in an area with a port icon. We will first talk about exploring, which is the bulk of the game.
When you explore, choose the number that you are exploring. Then turn to that numbered entry in the storybook. You're looking for the entry number, not the page number. Then start reading from top to bottom. Usually, the entry will unfold the story of your adventure in a rich narrative style, although if you want to skip that to get through the game more quickly, you can read the bold summary text with the little book icon. The rest of the text, especially anything in italics, tells you how the story affects the game. For some entries, you will simply read the story text and then resolve the effect as written. Or, you could be met with a choice, indicated by letters, here there's A and B, but there could be more. Read the options in full without reading beyond the last one, and then make a choice to resolve. While exploring, you may gain resources, for which you take the appropriate resource tokens and add them to your shipboard as we did before. You may gain experience points, which are marked on your journey log, or you may gain a specific numbered quest or adventure card, which is taken from its appropriate box, with quests added to a central collection of quest cards, and adventures added to your common supply. Each quest that the players have contains a keyword, and the active keywords you have will often change the story paths you take or the options open to you. Regardless of what you find when you explore, or how long a single explore action goes, you will continue reading and continue going to new passages to read until you reach the words return to the ship. The words return to the ship signify the end of an explore action. There are two types of encounter that you'll regularly find as you explore. These are challenges and combats. A challenge is signified by one of the game's five skills, strength, perception, savvy, craft, or cunning, written in capital letters next to a number. This here is a Craft 11 challenge. First, the active player chooses which of their crew members, plus the captain, they want to involve in this challenge. Each crew member involved is given a fatigue token. The second fatigue token is placed this side up, and once a crew member has two fatigue, they cannot be involved in a challenge. Each of that crew member's icons in the chosen skill contributes to the challenge value. So here, for craft, Audrey contributes two, and the captain contributes one. Then any other players in the game may spend one command in order to involve any number of their characters in the same way. So this player spending one command could bring both of these crew members into the challenge, adding a further three craft icons, giving the players a base of craft six. Next, flip and discard the top card of the ability deck and add its fate number to your challenge. So here it's three, adding up to craft nine. Fate values range from one to six. Next, there are several ways that the challenge value can be increased further after the fate draw. The active player could spend a command token onto a common adventure card in order perhaps to gain additional icons. Or onto an effect which allows a second fate card to be drawn and the higher of the two chosen. The active player could resolve a similar effect on one of their own crew boards. This one allows another fate card to be drawn only if the first one showed the number one. Or any player could use an effect like this to add one to the number of the fate card just drawn. The card or crew board used for any of these cannot contain any command tokens, and if there are any there, they must be cleared off using a bridge or quarters ship action before those effects can be used again. Any player, active or inactive, may also boost the result by one by discarding from hand an ability card showing this challenge's skill. If, after all of this, you reach at least the number shown next to the challenge, then you have succeeded at the challenge. If not, then you've failed. If you succeed, you'll skip over the fail line and then continue reading. If you fail, then read the fail line and, unless stated otherwise, continue reading. In this case, for example, success will lead you to another paragraph, while failure tells you to return to the ship, ending your action. However, in this challenge, while failure will result in these negative effects, both success and failure will result in continuing to the next paragraph. 
If the failure effect of a challenge tells you to lose a certain amount of health, then that many wounds must be distributed among the crew members who took part in the challenge. But you have free choice to distribute them however you wish among active and inactive players crew members. If while distributing wounds all of the crew members involved in the challenge are reduced to zero health, then any excess wounds go to any other crew members. A crew member with zero health cannot be selected for a challenge until at least one wound has been healed. You may also be instructed to gain one of the game's five negative status tokens. Here again, these must be given to a crew member who was involved in the challenge, and no crew member may have more than one of the same type of status token. Again, if there is no valid target among the crew members who were involved, an inactive crew member takes the token. The other sort of encounter you may come across is a combat, and this will be indicated by combat followed by a series of numbers. Take the matching numbered cards from the combat deck, shuffle them, and then lay them next to each other in a random order. Evenly distribute the four combat tokens among the players in the game, or if you're playing with three players, give two to the active player. A combat is resolved in rounds. Each round is resolved in four player turns, and at the end of the round, the enemy will fight back. There will be as many rounds of combat as required to defeat the enemies, or until all the crew members have been defeated. Each player turn is resolved in the following way. First, any player, active or inactive, may send one of their crew members into attack by placing one of the combat tokens onto the character. During this step, a player may spend a command token to give their remaining combat token to a different player. As usual, the captain is available to all players. A single crew member may attack no more than twice in the same round of combat. Next, choose one of that crew member's weapons. Each crew member starts with one pre-printed weapon, but at any point outside of a combat, you may equip another weapon from an adventure card to one of your crew members. Let's say here that we're going to attack with the Zokmir Harpoon. Next, choose one of the enemies to target with this attack. Here we'll choose the Infested Eye because it has the lowest defense, 4 versus 5 or 6. Next, draw an Ability card and then add its Fate value to the Accuracy bonus on the weapon you've chosen. So here, 2 plus 4 is 6. As for challenges, you can then boost that by spending Command Tokens to activate Adventure cards which boost your accuracy or crew bonuses affecting accuracy or fate. If the final result meets or exceeds the defense value of the enemy that you're attacking, then you've landed a hit. If not, you've missed. If you hit, determine the amount of damage done by checking the number inside this hit icon. You may add to it by discarding already equipped cards from that crew member that match the icon shown here. So discarding this would turn it to a hit 4. Some crew command effects and adventure cards can increase the number of hits further. Then place that number of wound tokens onto the enemy that you hit, starting in any location and then placing all of the rest orthogonally adjacent to one you've already placed on this hit. You may also optionally do splash damage, which allows you to place these wound tokens onto an adjacent space of an adjacent enemy as long as at least half of the tokens are placed on your main target. If you want to cover up a heart with a number inside it, then you must spend that many wound tokens to place one. If you place a wound token onto any square containing a little red diamond, that allows you to take that character's combat synergy token and give it to any other crew member. When that crew member is activated in a subsequent combat turn, this combat bonus may be used, at which point it is returned to the common supply. Although there may be a vast variety of icons on all of these enemies, ultimately what you're trying to do is cover up all of the hearts, and if you successfully cover every heart on an enemy, that enemy is defeated and removed from the combat. If at this stage of the combat, so after applying hits if you are successful, or after missing if you are unsuccessful, if the enemy has not yet been defeated, then that enemy counterattacks. 
the enemy deals damage equal to this number plus any numbers in uncovered hit icons. So here it's two plus two is four and deals that much damage back to the character who attacked it. That crew member automatically blocks an amount of that incoming damage equal to the block value on the weapon that was used. So here it's two and can block further by using adventure cards with command tokens and so on. So here this would be a total block of three out of the four resulting in one wound. After the counter attack, if the crew member missed with the attempted attack, then that crew member now gets to do one damage to the enemy. New strikes do not need to be orthogonally adjacent to old ones. You will resolve all four turns in the round of combat in this way. Choosing a crew member to attack, drawing fate to see if you successfully hit the enemy, placing wound tokens on the enemy if successful, suffering a counter attack if the enemy is still alive, and doing one damage if you missed. You can give a combat token to another player at the cost of a command token and you cannot attack with a crew member who is out of health or who has already attacked twice in this round. Remember as well that a crew member with two fatigue tokens does one fewer damage when dealing damage to the enemies. This includes when you miss, so you don't get to do the consolation damage with a fatigued crew member. After all four of the player turns of combat have occurred, proceed to the end of the round. Here, from left to right, each enemy attacks again. Choose a single crew member who will take all of the incoming damage from this enemy. Here, it would be three. The crew member may block some of this incoming damage using adventure cards or crew effects, but unlike a counter attack, may not use the blocking power from their weapons. Then if one of the game's negative status tokens is uncovered, then the team must choose which crew member gains that particular token. This may be a different crew member to the one who took the damage. Proceed down the line in this manner until all enemies have been resolved. Then return all of the combat tokens back to the players who originally had them and start another round of combat. Continue playing in this way until either all players or all enemies are out of hearts. The only other icon you'll find during combat is the wings icon, which represents a flying enemy. A flying enemy's defense is increased by one against a melee weapon, but not against a ranged weapon shown by this arrow. An enemy stops flying once its wings have been covered. Once you've won the combat, return to the storybook and continue reading. Travel is how you move your ship around the map, and to do a travel action, you must do a craft challenge. And this is the same as any challenge you'd find in exploring, except that you may only use one crew member rather than multiple. You may move up to a number of areas around the map based on this table of what you score on the challenge. An area on the map is any region which is delineated by these dotted lines, the spiral bind of the book, or the edge of a page. When you travel, you simply move the ship over one of these lines or delineations to an adjacent space. When you move off the page, you will turn the map to the page that is shown in this arrow. Then enter in any area on the corresponding side of the page. If your ship enters an area containing a challenge, then you will attempt to complete that challenge. In this case, a strength five. If you fail the challenge or choose not to attempt it, then you will suffer the negative effect shown and any damage shown in this sort of challenge is done to the ship. The third type of action is the market action, which may only be done in an area containing a market. Deal out seven adventure cards from the market deck and then you may purchase as many of them as you wish using the ship's money for the price shown in the bottom right corner of the card. Any weapons should be equipped to crew members and anything else will go into the common team's adventure card supply. Unpurchased cards are then gathered up and placed onto the bottom of the market deck. The final option is to visit a port and this may only be done in a region containing a port icon. Here you may perform any or all of the four port actions. You can pay four coins to visit the inn, doing this once per visit, 
in which case all players will heal two wounds and one fatigue per crew member. You can visit the shipyard to pay building materials or coins to remove red cubes from your shipboard. You can visit the healer to heal as many of your crew members back to full health at a cost of one coin per crew member. This will heal their wounds, but not their negative statuses or fatigue. Or you may spend experience points to level up your crew members. Look through all the level up cards in the game, and this is not all of them, and choose any that you want to purchase. Cross out its experience cost in your journey log, then equip it to the corresponding crew member. These do not go in your ability card slots. They do contribute to the skill that that crew member provides when fatigued in a challenge, and they cannot be discarded to increase the number of hits in a combat. Across a campaign, a crew member may have as many of their level up cards as you can afford. We've seen the importance of the skill icon and many of the ways to use that on the ability cards, but most of the ability cards also have some sort of effect which is in play for that crew member when equipped. Often this is a passive ability. Sometimes the ability requires the spending of command tokens, and when doing this these are returned to the supply, they don't go on the card or the crew member. There are also some which have an immediate effect at the moment they are equipped. The negative statuses can be quite harmful or restrictive to your crew members. A crew member with Venom loses one health at the start of each player's turn, which will take them down to zero very quickly. A weakened crew member is minus two on skill checks. Madness makes you lose a health to be involved in a challenge. Low morale makes you pay a command token to be used in a challenge and a frightened crew member cannot attack in combat. Additionally, there are no default actions, neither on the ship nor at a port, which removes negative status tokens. To remove them, you must either use the command abilities on certain crew members, or use an adventure card with a remove status effect. One important type of adventure card you're going to come across are the recipes, and you do start with two of them. These are the main use for the food that you find through your journey, and you can spend a command token to use a recipe, discarding the required food in order to heal the fatigue, negative effects, wounds, or statuses shown. The world of Sleeping Gods is yours to explore at your own pace, and a major part of the continuity of this story will be told through the quest cards. A quest card with no wave icon simply tells you what you've done and gives you a keyword for continuity. But a quest with a wave icon gives you some information that you've learned and gives you some clues for where you might want to go hunting in order to solve this part of the story. At many stages during the game, the book will tell you to remove one of your quests, in which case you place it into the used quests box. Through the game, you'll also come across totems, which are specific numbered adventure cards that have this icon up in the top corner. Your aim is to find as many totems as possible. Your crew may suffer defeat in two ways, either by every damage space on your ship being filled, or by all nine crew members being reduced to zero health. If this happens and you're playing the normal mode of the game, then move your ship to the nearest port and either remove all crew damage and fatigue or all ship damage, depending on which defeat you triggered. Then discard six cards from the top of the event deck and mark a defeat in your journey log. This will affect your final score. If you're playing in brutal mode, then the game is over and you'll have to start again. Part of the progression of the game is driven by the event deck. The first time this is empty, then instead of drawing an event, you will read story 1. The second time this happens, you'll read story 1.2. Those two stories will tell you how to reconstruct the event deck. The third time this happens, you'll read story F1. There are no instructions for the fourth time, so make of that what you will. Eventually, you'll reach an ending in the storybook, and that will be the end of your campaign. You can add up a final score 
based on this formula on page 34 of the rulebook, gaining points for all the adventure cards, totems and quests that you've found, as well as level ups, leftover resources, and losing points for each defeat in the campaign. Then, to play again, mark off all of the totems and endings that you've found in this campaign. Work out the total number of different ones that you've encountered and mark off the appropriate box down here. As you find more totems and endings, that will unlock more quests that you'll gain from the start of the next campaign, sending you off on another different direction. The campaign can be played over multiple sittings and there are instructions on pages 31 and 32 of the rulebook for saving your game and setting it up again. And that's how to play Sleeping Gods. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoy this video or find this useful, please help us by hitting the like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new and exciting videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comments section below. Until next time.